Coming up next, Sitting at 30 takes you downtown for the weekly luncheon meeting of the City Club of Portland. Live weekly coverage of City Club is made possible in part by TCI and is produced through the facilities of Portland Cable Access. Now we join the City Club for this week's program. Good afternoon. Welcome to another outstanding City Club program. I'm Pete Heuser, President-elect of the club. I also want to welcome our live television audience on uh, sitting at 30. Today we travel into the future and look back at the effects of the implementation of Metro's 2040 plan with three local experts and City Club members, Robert Liberty, Ethan Seltzer, and Carl Abbott. But first I have a few announcements. We have a new member, Chuck Martin. Chuck is running for Metro Council. Chuck here, stand please. There's Chuck. On March 6th, one week from now, we'll focus on the growing gambling industry in Oregon. We have a top-notch panel with Peter Bragdon, member of the Governor's Commission, Bruce Thomas, president of Spirit Mountain Casino, Chris Lyons, who's director of the Oregon Lottery, and Ellen Lowell from the Ecumenical Ministries of Oregon. That meeting will be here at the Multnomah Club. As you know, several weeks ago, we began a special membership drive for those who joined by the end of February, or really the end of the day today, the $25 setup fee is waived. So now is the time to join. If you're thinking about joining, I'm happy to say that we have 70 new members since the first of the year. Our board host, good. Our board host today is Jay Formick. Jay is executive director of Oregon Heat and a member of the Board of Governors. Uh, after Jay asks the first question of our panel today, we'll open it for questions from City Club members in the audience. As always, introduce yourself as a club member and uh, please keep your questions short. No speeches, please. Broadcast of City Club programs this quarter is made possible in part because of generous corporate support from Fred Meyer, Washington Mutual Bank, and Stowe Reeves. Now thanks, yes, let's give a hand to our corporate sponsors. And in fact, uh, thanks to the generous support of our corporate sponsors, the City Club has been able to purchase a multi-dimensional time travel machine. Your program committee used it to bring back today three planning experts from the year 2040. Our three speakers will each look back toward our own era and tell us how Metro's 2040 plan really worked out. Now we're fortunate to have with us today Robert Liberty, who is the Executive Director of A Thousand Friends of Oregon, Ethan Seltzer, the Director of the Institute of Portland Metropolitan Studies, and Carl Abbott. Carl is Professor of Urban Studies and Planning at Portland State. Robert Liberty has degrees from the University of Oregon, Oxford University, and Harvard Law School. He's been executive director of A Thousand Friends since 1994. Robert is a member of the Metro's Future Vision Commission and chair of the National Growth Management Leadership Program. It's an association of state and regional nonprofit planning advocacy organizations. But Robert will not be speaking on his own behalf today, but rather he will be channeling for Dr. Tom McCall Seltzer, who was born on August 16, 1998, almost nine months to the day after the Metro Council adopted the regional framework plan. Now, Dr. Seltzer tells us that despite his father's training and work in planning, he was an unplanned addition to the family <laughs> caused by an overly exuberant celebration of the framework plan's adoption. <laughs> Tom Seltzer received his PhD in planning from the University of California at Medford. In 2034, he became the youngest director of the Institute for Cascadian Metropolitan Studies, where he teaches extension courses received by students in three different continents and on the moon. <laughs> 
He is the author of many articles and his book on regional planning will be released as an interactive holographic music video <laughs> in 2041. Tom Seltzer will look back from the perspective of 2040 to tell us how Metro's 2040 planning process actually worked out. Ethan Seltzer, Tom's father, we'll hang on a minute here, Robert. Uh, Ethan Seltzer, Tom's father, has been director of the Institute of Portland Metropolitan Studies at Portland State University since 1992. Ethan is responsible for developing a program of research and service that brings the resources of higher education to bear on the critical community issues of the six county Portland metropolitan area. Prior to joining the Institute, Ethan was the land use supervisor for Metro. Earlier, he served as an assistant to City Commissioner Mike Lindbergh and held several other positions in government service. Uh, Ethan received his bachelor and, ma bachelor and master's degrees from Swarthmore College in Pennsylvania and a doctorate in city and regional planning from the University of Pennsylvania. Now, Ethan has spent his entire professional career planning for all of us, and despite his shortcomings in the area of family planning, he, he has not overlooked planning for his own future. Ethan confided in me that he plans to spend the time between now and 2040 perfecting the ballroom dancing techniques, and in fact, he hopes to be teaching the tango well into the next millennium, and he did tell me this. Uh, so if you see the City Club Growth Management Committee meetings being scheduled for the Crystal Ballroom, you'll know that Ethan is well on his way to uh, reaching his personal goals. Now, Ethan has not told me who he'll be channeling for today, but hopefully it will be somebody that knows more about city planning than ballroom dancing. Carl Abbott is Professor of Urban Studies and Planning at Portland State University, where he's been teaching for the past 20 years. Carl received his bachelor degree from Swarthmore College, like Ethan, and his PhD from the University of Chicago. Carl has published many books and articles on the history of American cities and on planning in the Pacific Northwest. He is currently co-editor of the Pacific Historical Review and is beginning work on a book about metropolitan Portland in its regional setting. Carl is, op is optimistic that he will be able to complete his book prior to the year 2040. Carl will be channeling today for his grandson, Dr. Robert Liberty Abbott, <laughs> a, a professor of planning at the University of Cascadia. Robert Abbott received his BA and PhD from Portland State's Eugene campus. <laughs> now, <laughs> gentlemen, I'll turn the program over to you. Robert Liberty. In 2040, most of us cannot imagine what this region was like 50 years ago. Back then, the newest and biggest industry was the manufacture of a now forgotten computer component called a silicon chip, which rhymes with buggy whip. Cities and counties, rather than regions and neighborhoods, were the chief units of local government. No Hispanic or Asian had ever been governor of Oregon. And the primary means for citizens' participation in the decisions affecting growth was through a public hearing a method unchanged in three centuries. But as remote and backward as that time now seems, the urban form and systems of transportation and governance familiar to us in 2040 are the result of decisions and institutional changes made by Metro, the predecessor to the Ten Rivers Council created in 2021. The farmland in the North Willamette Valley and the forest lands cloaking the foothills of the Cascading Coast Ranges, lands which distinguish our region, from all other metropolitan regions in the western United States were protected from sprawl by the framework plan and Oregon's land use laws. Without the plan and those laws, there would have been no Oregon strawberries in the bustling Walmarts and Fred Meyers of Shanghai, no Oregon hops brewed into the beer drunk in Osaka, and no Oregon timbers built into the chic bungalows of Kuala Lumpur. The continuing expansion of our light rail network was assured by Metro's regional framework plan. All the arguments about the cost effectiveness of light rail were vaporized by the nuclear devices detonated over Kuwait and Saudi Arabia in the Second Gulf War. I remember that my dad, Ethan, got a black eye in a fist fight that broke out at the Sunset Max station between the regular light rail commuters 
and the newcomers flooding the stations during gas rationing. Another major innovation implemented through one of the amendments made in 2007 to the framework plan was the construction and dedication of segregated truck transit lanes on highways and some major arterials. These segregated lanes reduce the hazards caused by mixing cars and trucks at high speeds. They reduce the cost of building and maintaining the parts of the road reserved for cars only, and they allowed buses to travel faster at rush hour than auto traffic. Metro's framework plan deserves substantial uh, credit for smoothing the inevitable transition from a housing inventory built for an era when families were larger and relatively more affluent and land was cheap to the housing needed today in 2040 by our older, smaller, relatively less affluent households in an era of high land prices. Now, the same transition occurred all across the United States, but only through the contentious and prolonged process of state courts striking down exclusionary zoning, which prohibited lower cost types of housing. Of course, as we now know, um, Metro's regional framework plan fell far short of its objectives in many respects. One of the most important failings was the absence of a really effective and enforceable strategy to make sure that people could find affordable housing in the same communities where they worked. The first decade of the 21st century revealed that the metro region had fallen prey to what was then called the San Jose Syndrome. More and more jobs became concentrated in Hillsboro and environs. The moderately priced housing affordable by these workers and service sector employees was limited to mid Multnomah County and a few southeast metro communities. These areas had to serve the housing needs of citizens of middle and lower incomes, while a small number of western and southern suburbs captured the new tax base, the jobs, the upper end housing. The polarization of the region into have and have not cities revived interest in the idea of a shared property tax base, an idea widely promoted by future Minnesota Governor Myron Orfield at the turn of the century. Tax base pooling was adopted by Metro in 2004, but only in the form of a sanction for local governments which failed to provide for housing affordable to persons of modest incomes. For three years, a few scofflaw communities continued to shirk their housing responsibilities, confident that Metro lacked the political will to impose the sanction of tax base sharing. They were mistaken. Metro executive Robert Liberty instituted tax base pooling <laughs> in, in 2007. After Liberty was recalled in 2008, and John Chandler had defeated Jim Zarin in the special election, <laughs> Chandler surprised everyone by maintaining the tax-based pooling program. The renegade cities were quickly convinced of the merits of allowing for a full range of housing opportunities. But the benefits of sharing a common tax base had become so obvious during this period that a more limited form of pooling for regional infrastructure and services was retained, leading after a long battle to the completely unified property tax base we have today in the Ten Rivers region. It turned out that technological change made the issue of the jobs housing imbalance in the Hillsborough area much less serious. Early in the 21st century, it became clear that the building blocks for computers, silicon chips, were going to be superseded the next decade, which would affect the related technologies in data storage, retrieval, and processing. The silicon forest experienced a selective cut. As many jobs migrated in fits and starts to the new high-tech centers of Detroit, Bombay, and Prague. The first silicon chip bust, the one in 2003, intersected with the regional planning effort in ways both well-known and obscure. The regional recession which followed the chip bust put an end to the third round of discussions about the need for a western bypass and a third bridge across the Columbia. It also delayed and ultimately ended preliminary discussion of the proposed Saddle Mountain Tunnel, a project which would have reduced commuting time between Tillamook and Hillsborough to 35 minutes. The chip bust also greatly changed the proposed bicentennial celebration of the Lewis and Clark expedition, and that in turn affected the development of our region in unexpected ways. The Tektronics Intel Fujitsu Nike Lewis and Clark exposition <laughs> was going to be a traditional world's fair, complete with self-congratulatory rhetoric, local boosterism, a thousand-foot-long titanium-clad replica of Lewis and Clark's dugout canoe, and big exhibit halls. The chip bus put a stop to much of the construction at the exposition site, which explains why Portlandia ended up holding a titanium canoe paddle in her outstretched hand. 
When a handful of small businesses offered some cut rate, cut rate prices for several buildings, the sponsors were glad to hand them over and take a tax deduction. One of the purchasers was Don Morissette, who used the empty shell of Phil Knight Hall as the first manufacturing facility for his small, well-built modular housing units, which everybody knows today as Morissette's, <laughs> the product which made Morissette fabulously wealthy. Another beneficiary of the downsizing of the Lewis and Clark Bicentenary was Metro. The sponsoring electronics companies had developed state-of-the-art computer hardware and software to be used to create an interactive network between people attending the exposition and persons and institutions throughout the region explored by Lewis and Clark. After the chip bust, the local electronic companies were going to dump the equipment and software, but Metro offered to take it, giving the donors another tax break. This hardware and software was used for the first effective electronic town hall meetings on regional planning issues. Today's practices of transmitting alternative images for development projects to all the home screens in the neighborhood and connecting these up with the public consultancy network of designers and engineers had its origins with the exposition's cast-offs. Those of you who wax nostalgic for the old town hall hearings instead of the vidnet meetings of today have never experienced the three-minute limits on testimony, the unfair advantages to parties able to hire their own attorneys or architects, and the long hours in steel folding chairs. <laughs> The Oregon Department of Agriculture used one of the now empty exhibition spaces at the Lewis and Clark Exposition site to build a restaurant featuring Oregon products, strategically located along the main promenade from the People's Republic of China exhibit. The head of the Chinese exhibition delegation was a woman who had been thrown out of the cabinet and packed off to remote Oregon because of her government's suspicions of her pro-democracy tendencies. Madam Lee developed a real fondness for the Oregon beef wine, beer, fruits, pasta, and ice cream served at the Department of Agriculture restaurant. She later said that if the exposition lasted another six months, she would have died of heart disease. <laughs> Within five years of her return to China, the Hong Kong riots led to the pink and gold revolution that swept Lee's faction into power. When she became Minister of Trade in 2011, she remembered Oregon foods. The booming Chinese market, now exceeding 1.4 billion people, was thrown wide open to Oregon's agricultural products. The resulting infusion of capital into Oregon agriculture allowed it to become even more diverse and competitive. And the relative importance of Willamette Valley farmland was amplified by the wave of sprawl, which washed over other equally valuable farmland in California's Central Valley. The spectacular events which ended the Lewis and Clark Exposition in the spring of 2005 ultimately remedied other weaknesses in the regional framework plan. A bond measure passed in 1996 proved grossly insufficient to protect all the natural areas needed to offset higher residential densities. The regulations in Title III adopted by Metro in 1998 proved to be too weak to prevent a lot of development in floodplains and on steep slopes, areas needed to protect water quality and control flood hazards. Nature provided the remedy. The Great Lewis and Clark Exposition flood, or rather the disaster relief of claims handed the federal government afterward finally washed away support for the National Flood Insurance Act. The repeal of that act did more in the long run here and across the nation to protect wetlands and riparian areas than all the planning regulation of the previous three decades. And the exposition flood provided some more immediate solutions to the lack of natural areas in the heart of the city. The tremendous downpour on May 19, 2005 triggered a flash flood on the eastern slopes of the West Hills, which overtaxed the stormwater drainage system. Tanner and Balch Creeks daylighted themselves, <laughs> bursting the mains and re-emerging after a century underground. That same day, the Johnson and Fano Creek floodways were swept clear of development, allowing the salmon to return. <laughs> Two weeks later, the crest of the flood led to the reformation of Guilds Lake in northwest Portland. History must move in cycles, because today that lake is being proposed as the site for a celebration of the 250th anniversary of the Lewis and Clark Expedition, assuming, of course, that Governor Two Clouds doesn't allow her personal distaste for the anniversary to lead her to veto the appropriation. Thank you. Thank you, son. <laughs> And uh, thank you, Pete, for the kind introduction. Um, I believe it was as big a surprise to me as I'm sure it was to everyone else. Um, 
I woke up this morning in the university district, and I had to marvel at what a difference a couple of decades can make. After Portland State's Urban Center Building won national recognition from the AIA, the district really took off. Today in 2040, the University District is a model for the redevelopment of the River District and the rest of the stops on the high-speed rail line between Vancouver, BC and Eugene. But enough of that. When it comes to the future, the question that's obviously on every people's mind, every person's mind is, what could have possibly followed coffee? Well, I'm here to tell you, many years later, that it wasn't nudity, though for a brief period in 2007 it was tried. It also wasn't growth management. By 2010, the stage was set for a revolution, a new age, an age that started with the adoption of a new planning goal, Goal 20, which called for the preparation of comprehensive land use plans without the use of forecasts and projections. By 2010, we had learned that the rate of growth made little difference to our thinking or our planning. In fact, by 2010, we had discovered that even if we did a fantastic job planning for the rate of growth, we still ended up with a landscape that didn't work, that didn't delight, and that didn't satisfy. Forecasts and projections are great things for sizing sewers or choosing the number of lanes for a road, but terrible substitutes for clarifying the soul of a region. What did Goal 20 accomplish? Goal 20, affectionately known as the planning without a net goal, forced communities to identify what they really cared about, no matter uh, what ought to be true about their Oregon landscape, no matter how many folks arrived and no matter when they got here. Now, at first, several planning office computers were overlooked during the great forecast delete of 2012. But by 2014, uh, communities were well into trying to figure out what mattered most, what distinguished them from all other places, what their contribution was to an Oregon landscape that offered the world something quite different. Our 20th century planning experience taught us that planning couldn't deliver on keeping things the same. However, in the 21st century, we learned that it could deliver on two things. Number one, preserving the heart of the landscape and second, advancing what folks really wanted to create. Planning began to be viewed as a vehicle for making things happen, but within a framework provided by the sacred places of this great state. Well, what did we do? Today in 2040, the accomplishments are many. Salmon habitat was restored, and that great icon of our region has flourished. The removal of the Dallas Dam, funded by the proceeds from tribal gaming operations, <laughs> not, not only restored Salila Falls, but added greatly to the spawning and rearing habitat of the main stem Columbia. The working landscape was maintained in the entire Willamette Valley. Sure, it was a little dicey at the turn of the century. However, the deepening of the shipping channel in the Columbia to 45 feet brought new customers for value-added agricultural products to the region, and the strength of that industry grew, grew along with the rest of our economy. Third, we incorporated a fly-by-wire relationship between every neighborhood and the native landscape of the Northwest. View corridors have been maintained, stream corridors have been restored, and the urban edge remains, remains well-defined. Fourth, we've been able to create and maintain economically viable town centers by recognizing that market was a unique, scarce, and rare resource and had to be conserved just as land had to be conserved. A commitment to both focusing the attention of commercial developers on specific locations and utilizing public investment in those locations finally paid off. Fifth, community life has become very local, very intense, and very rewarding. Communities that only wanted to wall themselves off found no solace in Goal 20, because little of what really mattered to folks could be defined well or even at all, if at all, by any single jurisdictional boundary. Thirteen years after the great forecast elite of 2012, communities by and large had elected to embrace Goal 20 in its entirety, since the only other option was endless, pointless, and a fruitless roll of the dice with an outmoded plan and inadequate ideas. You know, it wasn't too many years later, too many years after that, that it dawned on folks that if our prosperity was tied to a healthy, diverse environment, it wasn't too big a stretch to see that the systematic exclusion of thinking people from our society was a threat to how far we could go, to what we could achieve. By 2040, we finally got past simply honoring diversity and actually discovered it and put it to work. The landscape was our teacher once again. We learned that our competitiveness and therefore our power on an international stage required that we make diversity a renewable resource rather than merely a national holiday. Now this is not to say that everything worked out just fine. For example, our transportation system is still a mess. By 2035, we got rid of the notion of the jobs housing balance completely, finally realizing that this Southern California concept served as poorly as the notion of a job became totally transformed. 
It took a while, but we finally realized that what worked well for San Diego did little to help chart the future for this region. It turned out that we were far better at making an intolerable weight and traffic tolerable rather than changing the fundamental urge to hit the road. Today, we enjoy roadways capable of supporting the new autopilot commuter cars, cars that virtually drive themselves, while the driver multitasks on the phone and keyboard or simply catches up on their sleep. <laughs> in the comfort campaign of 2009, TriMet invested in a new fleet of buses with reserved seating, coffee, and onboard dry cleaning on their main routes. <laughs> Complemented by express helicopter service operated out of former park and ride stations. Now, as wonderful as this all may sound to some of you, the bottom line is still a level of service F. Sure, we've got travel options, but they all get stuck in the same traffic. Although we actually travel less today, it takes longer. And after experiencing a long period of declining trip costs, the cost of acceptable travel skyrocketed, just as the cost of a starter home jumped at the end of this, uh, the 20th century, as expectations changed and two and a half bathrooms became the norm. We now have a two-class society, those that can afford to travel productively and those that can't. At the turn of the century, housing affordability was something that got addressed, at least in part, through novel approaches to zoning, reallocation of resources to community development corporations, and the Rent with Dignity Act of 2001, a piece of legislation that created, created incentives for renting and the same tax shelters for savings as homeowners received. Now, unfortunately, we have yet to deal effectively with the growing disparity between the transported and the untransported. But we're proposing a real estate transfer tax for transportation in the 2041 legislative session. Fortunately, many other places in the nation ground to a halt before we did, and we've benefited from their experience. In fact, the consultants from Seattle and Vancouver, BC have made a fortune in this region. I suppose the last thing I'll mention is that is what, in fact, we mean by the region. Today, we can count on important relationships for what we do and when we do it, stretching the length of the I-5 corridor. However, the notion that this is our region is just that, a notion. Making it a shared notion is the primary work of leadership today and in the future. We're experts at very, very few things. By 2010, we finally realized that one of the few things was this place. The great delete clarified our values and focused our attention and forced us to do things together. The fact is that the future won't save us. We have to do it ourselves. Well, I wish I could tell you what followed coffee, uh, except today in 2040, people are still seeking the time to drink it. Thank you very much. Well, looking backward over the exciting changes of the early 21st century, um, many of us in the year 2040 turn with nostalgia to that quiet decade at the end of the 20th century. The tranquil 90s, as the historians term that placid decade. These were the years without a major foreign war, a time of economic prosperity and political stability. There were fierce debates over details back then how to expand health coverage, which wilderness areas to protect. But the nation sailed to the end of the 20th century with a remarkable consensus in Washington, D.C. The beginning of this century, the 21st century, of course, brought global economic upheaval. Uh, it was not the technological recession that many had feared, but a great economic takeoff, uh, the fifth great economic takeoff of the Industrial Age. Four times before, the incorporation of new technologies into the everyday economy had triggered 30-year booms. Steam engines, railroads, electricity, automobiles, and then, of course, in the early 21st century, another wave of economic growth keyed by information technologies, both electronic and, more importantly, biological. As these technologies worked their way into mass products, the years from 2000 to 2028 were a time of enormous prosperity and a booming stock market in the United States. We all enjoy the benefits of new products, uh, such as the uh, implanted wireless headset with holographic projection that allows us to check up on our kids or monitor the stock market while still driving with two hands on the wheel. People of my generation find it hard to understand why our grandparents um, are so squeamish about the genetically engineered cockroaches that clean our houses so spotlessly every night. <laughs> now, as we know, this new economic boom was overwhelmingly positive for Portland. 
the city that had marked time through much of the 20th century was ready to take off in the 21st. The 5.7 million residents of the Kalama Albany megalopolis are thankful that Portlanders stayed the course with growth management. Compact development that avoids wetlands and floodplains helped to minimize the damage from the big blowout of 2009 when a team of angry utility executives bended their frustrations with BPA by turning eco-terrorists and breaching Bonneville Dam. <laughs> More important in the long run was the great Olympics of Discovery, with which Portland celebrated the 200th anniversary of Lewis and Clark's explorations. Again, apart from the uh, titanium canoe, uh, we followed the leadership of the Oregon Historical Society. For 18 months, Portland became the intellectual hub of the globe. Concerts, exhibitions, lectures, symposia, and conferences brought the world's talent to interact in the River City. One spin-off has been the rise of Portland as a publishing, software, and think tank center to rival New York and Washington. Big city writers, executives, association presidents fell in love with Portland, made us one of the great idea capitals of the nation. In a rear guard defense of market ideologies, the Cascade Policy Institute now has swelled to 800 employees. But the Livability Foundation, created by 100,000 Friends of Oregon, <laughs> now has a staff of 1,500. <laughs> Another legacy of the Discovery Olympics was Major League Baseball. Mayor John Buchanan, elected in a landslide after raising $300 million for the public schools, <laughs> was able to convince the Multnomah Athletic Club to trade its old property for a site in the booming River District. With the extra elbow room, Portland converted Civic Stadium into a 55,000 seat facility to hold the huge audiences attracted by global poetry slams in Stadium Shakespeare. <laughs> the next year, we boasted the Portland Pioneers, one of the founding teams in the new Pacific Rim League, the first major league since the American League at the start of the last century. The other teams have included the Vancouver Drizzlies, the Tijuana Brass, the Panama Reds, the Tokyo Tycoons, the Soul Train, the Taipei Tigers, the Singapore Slingers, and the Manila Monsoons. Um, unfortunately for fans in the Philippines, they, they're often known as the Manila Folders because they tend to, to drop back in the end of the pennant run. Now, a very different reaction to the information age has been the stylistic dominance of industrial chic since the 2020s. As everyone became a symbolic analyst, remaining industrial landscapes became more and more precious and valued. Tourists now come from all around the world to stay in that one of downtown's 47 luxury hotels and wander the streets and alleys of our industrial sanctuaries on the central east side and northwest Portland. They come to admire the sweeping curves of the East Bank Freeway um, and the, the magnificent engineering of the Markham Bridge. Um, we become the Edinburgh of the Pacific, displaying the best of historic urban design alongside a vibrant information economy. Seemingly overnight in this era of industrial chic, North Portland became the most fashionable part of town. Affluent Portlanders abandoned the leafy isolation of Council Crest to realize their true desire to live close to the industrial action. Land prices in Linton quadrupled in two years. St. John's became the trendiest address. Luxury high-rise towers on North Lombard Street gave, give their lucky owners views of both Rivergate to the north and Terminal 4 to the south. Any house with a view of Swan Island and Mox Bottom now commands double the price of a comparable in East Moreland or Portland Heights. The changing tastes have made it possible for Portland to surpass the infill targets of the 2040 plan while lots in the old urban reserves go begging. And poor Dunthorpe suffered the fate that overtook the mansions of Northwest 19th Street and Knob Hill a, second, a century earlier. No longer desired by the elite, Dunthorpe mansions were divided into small apartments and single rooms. Uh, their oversized lots dotted with accessory apartments. 
Dunthorpe starving artists and Social Security pensioners depend on the riverfront rail line to get into town. There have been some political changes too. All over the world, city-states have come into their own as the natural units of government. The greater Portland area finally called it quits in its unhappy marriage with Eastern Oregon in 2024, forming the new state of Cascadia. That state stretches from Lincoln City and Astoria to Hood River and Mount Jefferson. Cascadia also acquired Clark, Cowlitz, and Waukiacum counties from Washington in return for a guarantee that all of Cascadia's information businesses would upgrade to Windows 2040 and use its web browser. <laughs> the capital of Cascadia is Oregon City. The state seal shows the copper goddess Portlandia riding endlessly up and down the Oregon City elevator. <laughs> and in the same reshuffling, Southern Oregon joined Northern California, Eastern Oregon joined Nevada, uh, followed in the footsteps of the 1990s by supporting its entire state budget from gambling and other legalized vice. Um, Route 140 from Klamath Falls down into Nevada is known to its publicists as the Casino Corridor to the public as Sucker's Alley. And finally, the separation of the state of Cascadia made Portland State University into the University of the Cascades, a flagship institution of higher learning that has flourished as never before in Portland's rich intellectual environment. The UC Torrance joined the Pac-11 in 2032, won their first Rose Bowl in 2036, and repeated just this past January. And if we can believe what we read in the sports section of the Cascadian, next season is going to be just as good. Well, thank you, Ethan Seltzer, Robert Liberty, and Carl Abbott. Um, you've presented a, a, a future, or, or told of a past, rather, that's rich in detail. I, for one, am not looking forward to the genetically altered house-cleaning cockroaches. <laughs> um, Mr. Abbott, you offered a vision of the state as a sort of fractured political entities and and uh, operating in independence of each other. I'd like to invite uh, uh, Mr. Ethan Liberty Robert Seltzer uh, <laughs> to respond in kind. And if you could tailor uh, a, a response uh, with the look back as uh, Mr. Abbott has done, um, let us know what, what Portland accomplished, how it worked with the rest of the state, or did it work in isolation? Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Well, Portland never works in isolation. You know, it's just a question of, of how effective Portland, you know, has been or can be. Um, and uh, I think it was the, um, the great good fortune of this city to have uh, um, a tremendous number of people who understood that what m was important about being here um, had its roots spread out through entire the Pacific, throughout the entire Pacific Northwest. Um, political jurisdictions are a political reality, uh, but I think what's going to overtake us in the next century is maybe uh, kind of a coming home to the notion that uh, living in this region has extraterritorial roots. Son, do you want to add something to that? <laughs> well, Dad, I know you're getting along, so you don't, <laughs> you don't remember some of the details. Of course, a very important element in bridging gaps between this region and the rest of the state of Oregon was the decisive defeat in 1998 of that Sizemore initiative, mm. uh, which <laughs> see, the, the dis, the dis, which which initiative was yeah. that? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not talking about Measure 55 or 89. This is the uh, Metro abolition measure. What happened was it forced people in other regions to discuss whether they'd like the opportunity to create institutions broader than a single local government to deal with issues like growth. And uh, they decided that they would like that opportunity. And furthermore, since most of the growth in Oregon in the 90s um, was occurring not in the Portland metropolitan area, but the rest of the state, they found that they had a lot more in common in trying to deal with these issues on a regional basis. And that's why they rejected the initiative and the Sizemore candidacy, 57 to 43. <laughs>
Chris Smith, club member. Uh, I'm a member of the research committee looking at uh, density in neighborhoods in Portland, and it occurs to me we could very much shorten our report writing process if our channelers would simply share with us how the city's traditional neighborhoods accepted increased density in the early part of the 21st century. <laughs> um, that's right. Well, I'd, I'd actually like to re respond to that because I think that, you know, one of the things that we tried to do in the late 20th century was solve each problem kind of by itself. We tried to kind of say, well, density is a problem. How are we going to sell density? Affordable housing is a problem. How are we going to deal with affordable housing? It took a while, but I think what we finally realized was that um, uh, if you go to folks and, and talk only about what you're trying to preserve, it doesn't quite work. Ultimately, you do have to talk about what you're trying to create. And although it took a while, we finally came up with a vision for, for what it meant to create an urban place in Oregon. And then it wasn't a question of density, it was a question of what we were trying to do. And uh, that's kind of the next step. Well, I think that you know, as, as I um, re read the history books, um, what happened is incremental acceptance. Um, I mean, what, what happened is that you know, in established neighborhoods, um, one, you know, one small infill project was built and turned out not to be quite so bad, which made it slightly easier to do something else. One accessory apartment was added on a block, and everybody sort of watched and waited to see what happened, and then it, it wasn't quite so bad after all, and then it was a little bit easier for it to happen again. And, you know, the way that some of the, uh, as I, again, recall, from from the uh, from the uh, histories, the way that some of that the resistance in established neighborhoods was overcome was was bit by bit incremental transformation of attitudes. So that ten years ten years after, in oh, uh, two thousand and eight, people couldn't quite recall why they'd been so upset about the city's accessory apartment uh, you know ordinance, for example. Erwin Mandel, City Club member. As a longtime science fiction fan, it's a great privilege to speak to three people from our future. Uh, Mr. Abbott may have already answered my question, but I, perhaps the other two might also respond to it. There is a question that is undoubtedly on the mind of every, citizens of, every citizen of Portland. In 2040, what became of Portlandia? <laughs> Well, <clears throat> in addition to having a titanium canoe paddle, it was actually important that she have a paddle because it turned out that the predictions about global warming underestimated the effect. Now, this meant there was a lot more waterfront available in the region and the low-lying areas. <laughs> but it was not necessary to move her because uh, the Fifth Avenue Canal brought lots of people right under her path. <laughs> and it killed the trees, actually. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, kelp or... Uh, adequate substitute, some people believe. Uh, <laughs> you know, people consistently underestimate uh, risks and natural hazards, and that was true even in the 1990s. In fact, right up until February 9th, 2033, everyone thought Mount Tabor was extinct. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Colleen Jensen, a member of City Club, and I'm very concerned about what your, quote, infill things are going to do to what I consider to be one of the uh, great things about Portland. And I live in the Northwest neighborhood, and I invite all of you to come up and see what Maywood and McClay look like. And most of that is infill, because I've lived there for about 15 years, and we didn't have anything sliding down the hill until infill started. And I hope you're not planning on putting any of those apartment buildings, because I don't think we can take them. Uh, in my non-channeling mode, I have to admit I am a apartment dweller renter in Northwest Portland. I think it's very important that people have an opportunity to live in different parts of the region, and a third of our housing stock in the United States in urban areas is renting. I don't think I'm unacceptable <laughs> scum that ought to be kept out of neighborhoods. <laughs> well, maybe some of you yeah, do. We're not going to take a vote on yeah. that. Yeah. 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 Thanks. Thanks. Keep your hands down. Yeah. We're going to take right. a vote. This is not. Uh, yeah. But uh, on the issue of development and steep slopes, I think uh, I indicated that um, it is important that we not put houses where they don't belong, that we keep nature near us. I don't think those are polarities. I think we will have some of both. Hi, uh, I'm Milt Markowitz, City Club member and also a doctoral student in urban planning uh, at Portland State, focusing on education policy. 
And uh, my question is, uh, I think we all know that most of the leadership in 2040 is in our primary and secondary schools today, or maybe hasn't gotten into there yet. And I was just wondering, in the process that you went through, were there visionaries in, in the primary and secondary education that were involved? And, and how do we see this public education system uh, needing to change to be able to, to uh, dialogue and create and do the kinds of things that you folks were talking about? That's a, that's a great question. You know, I mean, it's a great question for any age, because it seems to me, and, and every age, uh, because it seems to me that, you know, actually what it kind of begs is this question of um, what purpose, what role, what kind of uh, value does education have in the kind of society we want to live in, the kind of economy we want to enjoy, the kind of landscape, you know, that kind of ought, ought, ought to accompany us. Um, in the late 20th century, as I recall, there was um, very little kind of understanding of the role of children as citizens. Turns out that you're a citizen when you're born, not when you're old enough to buy a beer. Um, that when you walk down the street with a child, you're walking on sidewalks that that child owns and you own and every other citizen kind of owns. But we didn't quite understand what it meant to honor the citizenship of, of children. Uh, though we were um, terrifically worried about whether or not they could achieve certain results on certain kinds of tests. Uh, and later in the 21st century, I think we finally recognized that um, in uh, placing certain expectations on children and their role in schools and their performance in schools, that we, that should have been accompanied by a recognition of their role as citizens in this society. And it took a while for our institutions to change to catch up with that. But uh, I'm pleased to report that by 2040, um, we'd done something substantial. Uh, I could go on, but I think I'll stop now. <laughs> sure. The uh, bad news was that early in the 20th century, 21st century, the warnings that had been issued in the late 20th century about the risk to Portland Public Schools didn't lead to enough action to prevent a drop in attendance, a drop in uh, school-aged children of 30 percent over the course of four years. I think it was about starting about 2006. It was only thanks to the fact that we had done uh, equal damage in defunding schools in the suburbs that it wasn't worse. And it took many years to uh, return families with children to the city, uh, to schools where they felt their children were safe and would get a quality education. And uh, we needed more leadership at the end of the century to prevent that. I'm glad we finally overcame it, but it took a long time. I don't know, time. son. You know, you went to public schools and you turned out all right. I mean, you know. So. <laughs> Look, I'm still a renter. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and, and one of the the leadership changes, attitudinal changes, and leadership changes that was necessary was the realization that school policy and urban growth policy, for example, are intimately connected. That you can't simply plan, can, couldn't plan and develop and try to deal with policy for schools in isolation. So the the idea, uh, you know, how do you hold you know, a strong people? together with a strong public school system is also by holding strong neighborhoods together. And the intimate connection between a strong, attractive neighborhood and a strong, attractive, effective neighborhood school simply had to be recognized early in the 21st century uh, in order to see the, all of the pieces of a livable city together as one package. Hi, my name is Patrick Burnett, a City Club member. I'll ask a uh, fairly contentious question because I think this will remain contentious in 2040 and beyond. Um, the panel seems to have an optimistic view of 2040 and the institutions that administer it. And I, I would suggest it is optimistic uh, in uh, the following sense. Um, the institutions um, appear to uh, want to dig in their heels. Um, marginalize uh, its detractors and uh, forge ahead based on ideology. And I would suggest that, 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 that it might be the first institution in history to survive with that uh, sort of uh, mechanism in place. Perhaps uh, the people uh, on the panel can suggest what mechanisms were uh, adopted to make the process and the, and the institutions more responsive to uh, its uh, detractors and those that criticize the process rather than uh, forging ahead with a, a singleness of vision that may not be uh, valid 20 or 40 or 100 years from now. Yeah. You want to turn around? I'd love to. The, um, 
As I recall, and this was before I was born, there was a singleness of vision in the United States from the period 1950 on about how metropolitan areas developed, how they grew lower and lower densities, more and more dependence on automobile, less and less choices for people who couldn't afford an automobile, the one-third of the population that didn't have a dr valid driver's license couldn't afford a home in the suburb. Their choices were narrower. And we stayed on a single track in the entire United States for 40 or 50 years. It was what happened in this region that gave people the opportunity for choice. So the, the mechanism for responding to criticism, and as I understand the history of the 70s and 80s, the Oregon planning program went through a lot of crises and weathered them all, despite everyone's predictions that it would be repealed and abolished and turned back, because at root it had a democratic foundation. And that was one of the most important aspects of this Metro Council. It was the only democratically elected governing body in a region in the United States that had authority over the shaping of the region. And it was the first time that a metropolitan population had a democratic institution to make a choice about the future. It was the only place at that time. Now, of course, it's old hat in 2040. That's how it responded, because unlike the past, people had a choice. And that's what made the region distinctive and accounted for its economic success in the first half of the 21st century. You know, I think there's no question that um, uh, institutions particularly have to be extremely careful to make sure that many voices are heard, not just because it's important politically, but because there are so many possible outcomes in the future that to essentially limit your view to a narrow band, um, you know, really does kind of place your future at risk. On the other hand, I think that um, the point in many ways is not the institutions. It's really the values of the community. Uh, what do communities care about? And I think the institutions that communities have reflect that. I think in the end, the question isn't so much um, will we have the specific institutions that we have today in 2040 and 2080, um, as much as it is, uh, what is it that we really care about? And um, in the end, whether it's an institution or a law or a, a nonprofit organization, are we able to act on that collectively? I think underlying all of this uh, is the fundamental assumption that we're all in this together and that the best outcome for Oregon and for this landscape is not necessarily just simply whatever people want to do summed up, but there actually is an outcome that we're willing to say, yeah, is important to making this place a different kind of place, not now, but in the year 3000. I think if you believe that, um, then uh, it's a question of how do you make those values essentially drive the institutions, not how do you uh, basically respond to what appears to be um, out of control institutions uh, somehow uh, negatively affecting your life. Now, the last thing I want to say is that in thinking about the future, um, it's very difficult to come up with the apocalyptic view. I mean, actually, it's very easy and very difficult. It's very easy because it's easy to just kind of tell somebody else's story where that apocalypse kind of happened. Uh, it's very difficult because this place doesn't warrant that. And <clears throat> the, you know, institutions that have, that are run by elected officials, you know, the people do have levers that they can use to change direction. Um, when in the early part of the 21st century after um, Mike Burton had left Metro to become uh, Secretary of Transportation in the Gore for the Gore administration. Uh, <laughs> That's Leslie Gore, right? <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the voters, after well-funded campaigns, the voters first elected uh, Bob Tiernan as Metro Executive and then Steve Buckstein, um, both of whom discovered that um, given the constraints of land availability and environmental constraints and um, the opinion of the public, that the policies of Metro didn't really change that much. And in fact, then uh, after, by the, uh, actually, actually Mike, after eight years in Washington, uh, returned to Portland and oh, ran again for Metro because he just loves those early morning meetings. <laughs> and. Uh, discovered the, that the organization really hadn't taken a very different direction. Uh, Mike Burton, City Club member, <laughs> <laughs> former Secretary of Transportation. Yeah. <laughs> what I really want to ask you about is a recall of the executive officer in 2008. I'll like get details on that. But <laughs> if I recall, I think Dr. McCall, it was mentioned that that recall was precipitated because of a move to try to look at financing growth. And one of the key issues today for uh, a lot of people is the question of, of paying for growth, if you would. Uh, 
my house, which is in, in, in trendy St. John's, was <laughs> built in, in about 1900. And when I bought that house in 1970, a lot of the infrastructure uh, for that home had been paid for over a 90-year period, 70-year period at that time. It, it, it paid for a lot of these things. Today, growth is happening very rapidly. If you have large segments of the community, the demands against infrastructure is much more sudden, and the need for financing the streets, the roads, the water systems, the sewers, the, uh, the, the schools to do that, the pressure is greater. So I'm wondering, how did, how did we find our way out of that to finance and pay for the growth on an equitable basis for the people coming in and the folks who are still here? <laughs> <laughs> well, we finally figured out how to tax the internet. <laughs> Part Part of what happened, and it's, it's uh, wonderful to see you uh, alive, Mr. Burton. <laughs> I, was, I, I was just at the uh, Burton Museum the other day. <laughs> Part of what happened was that in the Oregon legislature, there had been in the 80s and 90s a comfortable um, trio of policy uh, inclinations, which were among conservatives, which were to be uh, against taxes, against planning and for local control. And by the 1990s, those had gone in three different directions. It was pretty uncomfortable. If you were for local control, a lot of local <coughs> people did not want growth, and they didn't want to pay for infrastructure. So if you were pro-growth, you had to become pro-financing for infrastructure. The pressure built up in the 90s and early, uh, uh, early 21st century when the potholes on I-5 got to look like jurisdictional wetlands. And uh, it became clear that it was going to be necessary to finance growth. And uh, all the different little taxes, there were so many niches filled, uh, I don't think it would be possible to find new uh, sources of revenue by, by 2030. It was hard to find new sources of revenue. But I think it became obvious uh, that the infrastructure was collapsing and that uh, it wasn't possible. So the pro-development, pro-growth advocates who have traditionally carried a lot of weight in politics became the effective advocates for new financing mechanisms. It included, in the interim, pretty high system development charges all over the state of Oregon. Uh, Chuck Martin, City Club member. Uh, Visioner Abbott uh, mentioned the uh, strength of the industrial sanctuaries in Portland, one of Portland's greatest assets, employing over 100,000 people in jobs from warehousing down through manufacturing. And I just wonder in your visioning what you see in the future or saw happening as far as industrial land within other areas of the metro area. Uh, you, there was another mention of Clackamas County, which right now has no industrial land available at all, and 60% of all wage earners in Clackamas County are driving to other counties to find jobs. And do you see in your vision uh, the fact that there will be other industrial sanctuaries formed in other areas other than Portland? Because you certainly don't see any mention of it in the framework plan as it exists, as it was just published. Sure. The, uh, one of the interesting uh, impacts of the, um, the information revolution by the 2020s is the, the comeback of the multi-story loft manufacturing building uh, as a replacement for the land-hungry horizontal factory surrounded by huge parking lots. Because as, the, as processes get more and more micro scale, you need less and less square footage so that you know, prosperous businesses could flourish on uh, in very compact quarters, which could, in fact, because you weren't lifting anything heavy, nothing bigger than a cockroach, uh, <laughs> you, know, you, could, you could in fact stack people on top of each other to create vibrant manufacturing districts that look not all that different from um, lower Manhattan 100 years ago in terms of the land use patterning. So that very little land ended up being needed for a lot of jobs. There was definitely a problem in the 2040 plan in the fact that uh, kind of honoring or deferring to work done by Hillsborough in the 70s and 80s, they were allowed to continue to get the lion's share of the new manufacturing uh, jobs. And uh, the problem, of course, was uh, highlighted when urban reserves were designated on the other side of the region. But no one had the guts to take that issue on and say, well, we do have an imbalance, and we need to make sure that some of this is distributed more evenly in the region. Um, and that led to a lot of transportation problems. Now, technological change ultimately meant, as 
my colleague here indicated that we didn't need nearly as much land for the same number of jobs. Even in the 1990s, office parks built in the same year in the same community, Lake Oswego, I believe it was called before the lake rose. Um, <laughs> Had, no, it's called the Venice of the Metropolitan Area. Right. Yeah. Had uh, the one of these uh, office parks had about a hundred, what was it, 210 employees per acre, and the other one had about 90. So that the discussion about land obscured the fact that there was huge differences in the efficiency of land use, and that meant, as with residential, there was actually a lot more land available if it was used wisely. Well, actually, and one of the more astounding developments was that in the late 20th century. 60% um, of the v value of products produced came from products that were less than 18 months old. Um, and that actually accelerated in the 21st century. And so what we found was that in this region, uh, to be competitive, we had to learn new ways not only of bringing products to market faster, but of not looking at uh, structures and the use of land as basically the last word on what would happen to those locations for all time. And I um, it looks like we're out of time to get a question from Ray, the legendary Ray Polani. I was just at the Polani uh, subway station uh, the other day. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right. And I want to say thank goodness he pushed to get that underground. <laughs> thank you for coming today. We try to have one of these panel discussions on growth and land use every year. We thought we'd do it a little bit differently. Thanks for your good questions. <laughs>